American-made bombs at an American airdrome somewhere in England, loading up for a raid on Nazi-held France. American flying fortresses, manned by Americans, serving notice on Adolf Hitler that they are here to fight. Operating as a complete striking force, the Americans bring their own pilots and combat crews, mechanics and ground men, calmly, efficiently checking every part of the giant ships. 3,000 miles from home and the Yankee sense of humor still with them. Every machine gun and cannon is tested before the flight. Now the crews assemble. Arriving on bicycles, they report to headquarters for final orders. Men from across the sea who have come to aid their brothers in arms, those gallant flyers of the RAF. It's the hour for which they've been waiting. Every face is tense as the operations chief issues secret coded instructions for combat, outlines the raid, its objectives, what every man and every plane must do. Officers and men ready for action. Scenes duplicated day after day as the United States Army Air Force unleashes its squadrons against the Nazis. Well-loaded scout cars, the familiar American Jeep, haul them to the points of takeoff. Brigadier General Eaker in personal command goes with his men. Now, one by one, the huge motors roar. Many of the men have been over before with the RAF. Now they're on their own. From the General's plane, ships of the squadron are sighted as they cross the channel. Daring raids by daylight, and the objective, Nazi munitions plants in occupied France. Sighting their first target, the bombardiers take over. Bombay doors swing wide, and all-American TNT, delivered by all-American ships and crews, finds its mark. Gunners have work to do when the fortresses are attacked by enemy flights, but they battle their way through and every ship returns safely to port. The general hurries to headquarters to report the latest mission a success. And again the crews assemble, this time to give details of their part in the raid. Grim, determined men, helping to smash the Nazi hold upon Europe's enslaved people. Yes, the United States Army Air Force is in the fight to the end. Here is a patriot. From his typical American home, Postman Morris goes regularly to work six days a week delivering United States mail. Every night and Saturday afternoons, he operates a one-man factory in the basement of his home. He has made and delivered 12,000 spokes for the steering wheels of new merchant ships. In recognition of this extraordinary service, Postman Morris is honored by his country. The Maritime Commission awards a medal and the M flag for efficiency. 84 hours work every week. Mrs. Morris adds her salute to that of the nation. Rendezvous in the Aleutian Islands, west of Alaska. United States Army transports, with naval support, stand offshore with reinforcements for America's most northern outposts. And over the side go veteran troops, well trained for just this sort of landing. Lighters and assault boats ferrying men and material to shore less than 125 miles from the nearest enemy base. 
This is just the beginning of offensive action to oust the Japs from the North Pacific. The main force moves in. Scout cars. Mobile artillery. Not a man or piece of equipment lost in the entire operation. The occupation, long and carefully planned, is executed without a flaw. Huge supplies of polar equipment are speedily landed that the men may have every possible comfort against the bleak Arctic winter. Tent cities spring up overnight, for the Americans are digging in to stay. Here on a mountainous volcanic island, whipped by fog and icy blasts, the United States Army encamps just 1,500 miles from the mainland of Japan. President Roosevelt makes an unprecedented 9,000 mile tour of the United States to see for himself the nation at war. Visiting armament plants from coast to coast, he stops at the giant Chrysler tank arsenal where he sees the Army's latest mechanized monsters tested as they come from assembly lines. One such juggernaut rolls in for close-up inspection, almost too close for Secret Service men guarding the President. Then, on to one of Henry Ford's great bomber plants where the President and First Lady are greeted by Mr. Ford and General Manager Sorensen. Plane workers, delighted with the surprise visit, show the President that wartime production is meeting the goal set, many plants exceeding their quotas. By car and by train, through 24 states, any one bigger than most European countries, the President inspects army camps sees for himself the growing might, the well-trained units of America's vast fighting forces. At a West Coast Navy yard, sailors wounded in the Battle of the Pacific get a quiet handshake from the man who himself has a son out there fighting with the Marines. Then another plane plant, where long-range consolidated bombers await ferry delivery to fighting fronts. And everywhere he goes, the President of the United States finds the people at work, building, producing, delivering the goods, determined to win the war. En route, he meets another son, also in the service. Then on to another Navy yard. salutes the officers of a United States submarine that sank nine Japanese ships and inspects a captured Japanese submarine that will never raid again. For two weeks, the president made a personal inspection of the nation. He finds Americans in the war 100 percent. 